So, you know how at the end of my last Homestuck video essay, I did an homage to the countdown from Cascade, and said the next essay I would make would be about the Homestuck epilogues? Well, I read the epilogues, and then I decided that I wanted to make a video about Dave instead. Dave Strider, the Knight of Time, turn tech godhead. He's a good character, and not just because his unhinged rambling conversations are among the funniest in all of Homestuck, but because he has a really well-written character arc that gets resolved at the end of the comic in a satisfying manner. And, you know, you can't say that about every character. Fun fact, Dave actually has the first line of dialogue in all of Homestuck, in a conversation about being tricked into drinking piss. I swear to God, Dave is a deep character, okay? Dave is introduced properly in Act 2 by cutting through the joke nameplate with the katana because Dave is cool. Not like in an actually cool way, but in that way you think things are cool when you're 13. Like, his weapon of choice is one of those cheap, shitty mall katanas that break immediately. Dave is lame as hell, and I thought he was the coolest character when I was 13 and first read Homestuck. The main way Dave's quote-unquote coolness comes across is through his laid-back, detached irony. Look at this fucker. He doesn't give a fuck about anything except as part of an ironic joke. He doesn't treat the game seriously at first, and because of that, his friends almost die. One really nice thing about Homestuck is that because most of it's via chat messages, different characters' dialogue is written differently. This gets a bit dumb with some of the trolls, but it works perfectly with Dave. The fact that he doesn't have any capitalization or punctuation makes him sound like he's just monotonely rambling to himself, which is a really solid part of his characterization. The first challenge Dave has to overcome is getting through his apartment, where he lives with his older brother slash actual father that is filled to the fucking brim with the creepiest puppets on the planet. Look at this abomination! It was forged from nightmares and contains the soul of the devil. Let's be honest, when Lil Cow blinks, none of us were surprised. We all slammed our fists on the table and shouted, I knew it! I knew that thing was evil! Of course Dave is afraid of it. It moves when he isn't looking. I'd be nervous when fist bumping it too! Although, of course, it isn't actually ambulatory on its own. Lil Cow is moved around by Dave's bro, who uses his flash step to torment and gaslight Dave. Bro invites Dave up to the rooftop for a duel, and we are introduced to the guy Dave wishes he could be. Bro is so fucking cool. Remember when he cut the meteor in half? And when he fought Jack blow for blow? During the fight on the roof, the two striders' his blades meet, and Dave snaps in half when it collides with Bro's unbreakable katana. He kicks Dave's ass so hard that, because of the weird RPG rules the universe runs on, Dave loses the ability to even wield swords. He beats Dave so hard the symbol on Dave's shirt changes. He throws Dave down a flight of stairs, and wow, now that I say that out loud, that sounds really abusive. As does the constant gaslighting and the fucked up Saw torture shit. Really interesting narrative trick that Homestuck pulls on the reader is the revelation that Bro Strider is abusive, because in hindsight, it isn't really a revelation. It was very obvious from the start, but myself and a lot of other Homestuck fans I've talked to didn't really pick up on it during the early acts. Bro is initially seen entirely from Dave's perspective, and it takes Dave a long time to realize his childhood was fucked up. The reader admires Bro and ignores his faults, because Dave does. It also works because Dave's relationship with Bro is shown alongside John and Rose's relationships with their parents. John and Rose both claim to have abusive childhoods, but they're full of shit, which leads the reader to subconsciously assume any flaws with Bro are also exaggerations. Except, we see him beat the shit out of Dave. Throughout the comic, Bro casts a shadow on Dave, both as a source of his trauma and as a hero he could never live up to. I think this relationship between brothers, or more accurately between father and son, is the heart of Dave's character. Dave's arc is bookended by two fights on rooftops, two older brothers, and two broken katanas. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Partway through Act 4, before Dave even enters the medium, the comic suddenly cuts to Dave in the medium, four months into the future. And goddamn, that was a bold writing choice. Turns out Terezi accidentally killed John and by extension Jade, thus trapping Dave and Rose in a doom timeline. Oops. In this dark future, Dave prototyped that fucking puppet, 
resulting in an evil sprite who just sits around and laughs at his failures. God, I hate that thing. One thing that I paid special attention to on this reread was Dave's swords, because there's a metric fuckton of symbolism in Dave's weaponry. This doomed Dave still wields a broken sword, except he's fused it with his timetables, allowing him to mess with time and make it whole again. He's using time travel as a weapon and as a way to overcome his shortcomings. And it's fitting that this version of Dave ends up fixing things by traveling back in time and saving John. Then, to avoid being Lars Fillmord, this Dave prototypes himself. He steps back from the role of hero and becomes a guide for the main version of Dave. The first thing we see the main Dave do with his new time machine is attempt to fix a mistake. This results in a doomed version of him being brutally murdered. Dave is forced to dispose of his own corpse and just stands there, staring at his bloody hands. I'd make a joke about him needing therapy, but he's a Homestuck character. The fact that he needs therapy is a given. Dave gets to work managing the time loops and keeping everything running because if he makes sure everything goes like it's supposed to, he doesn't have to deal with any more dead Daves. Except, the way things are supposed to happen is awful, and involves everyone dying anyway. INCLUDING HIM! He realizes how he's going to die, but has to go to the land of Frost and Frogs and set it up, because otherwise, that would cause a paradox. And paradoxes mean dead Daves! Hey, speaking of dead Daves, remember Terezi's coin flip? No, not that one, the other one. Where she tries to get Dave to kill himself. That was fucked up. Terezi manipulates Dave into creating a Doom Timeline alternate version of himself and tries to convince the main Dave to kill him so he can A, become a god tier, and B, not be killed by the rules of time travel. But Dave refuses. He doesn't have the ruthlessness needed to kill himself. You know what's weird? One of the most enlightening scenes that shows who Dave is as a person is a conversation with Equius. Not a character I really associate with Dave, but that's who Dave talks to when he finds Khaled Folk. Dave comes across the Sword in the Stone. Literally, Khaled Folk is another name for Excalibur. And don't at me about the Sword in the Stone being a different weapon. Arthurian myth is notoriously contradictory, and every part of the legend has multiple retellings, some of which have Excalibur as the Sword in the Stone, including Homestuck. Dave comes across the Sword in the Stone and tries to pull it out. Except, he can't. It won't budge. Equus advises Dave to just be strong like his bro trained him to be. Instead, Dave chops through a pillar, shouting, Bow before your new king, bitch! And the pillar smashes the sword in half, allowing Dave to pull the handle out. But that's fine. After all, broken swords are Dave's thing. Afterwards, Dave talks to Dave Sprite, who explains that Dave had to break the sword as part of his quest. John could have pulled it out. John's a hero with a pure heart, but Dave... Dave had to break the sword, because Dave isn't really a hero. What's left of the legendary piece of shit trades hands a few times throughout the comic, is eventually reforged into the royal Derringer, then finally ends up back in the hands of Dave, who BREAKS IT AGAIN IMMEDIATELY! STOP GIVING DAVE SWORDS! HE CANNOT BE TRUSTED WITH THEM! The thing is, there's one sword Dave can't break. The scene where Dave finds his bro's corpse is one of the best written scenes in all of Homestuck. Dave finds him lying in a pool of his own blood, murdered by Jack Noir, and he reacts with jokes and detached irony. He says that he didn't love bro, and insists that he isn't broken up about it. And at this point, we should probably talk about Dave's personality. He reacts to everything with laid-back indifference. He acts like he doesn't care, that it's all just a big joke to him. And that is so clearly, clearly a coping mechanism. It's how he coped with being trained from birth to be a warrior by a man who hated him. It's how he copes with being forced to throw his own corpse into a volcano. It's how he copes with every fucked up thing the story throws at him by trying and failing to pretend he isn't bothered by it. Dave decides to take the sword, but he refuses to pull it out. Because heroes pull swords out of stone, and Dave isn't a hero. Bro was, John is, but Dave, Dave isn't a hero. He runs jump kicks the sword, and gets flung back like a loser. Dave is left feeling like a failure. His relationship with his brother is left unresolved. Even in death, Dave can't overcome him. The aimless renegade tries to convince Dave to go fight Jack, but Dave doesn't. He knows that he would lose, because if his bro couldn't kill Jack, 
then there's no way in hell Dave could. Dave points out that if he was a hero, he would fight Jack. He would rise up and kill the big bad wolf and save the day. But Homestuck isn't that type of story, and Dave knows it. He explains to Rose right before Cascade that he hates maintaining the time loops. He hates planning to guarantee his inevitable death. He doesn't want to be the Knight of Time, he just wants to be the Dave of Guy. He doesn't want to be the hero. And yet, the moment he realizes Rose is in danger, he flies off to save her. He joins his sister on a suicide mission because he doesn't want her to die alone. And then Cascade happens and it's the coolest shit ever and that moment where Dave and Rose exit the green sun and the violence kick in, Jesus fuck that was good. What was I talking about? Right, Dave cares deeply about his friends and will do anything for them. And I don't know, that's kind of heroic. In Game Over, he takes on Jack Noir and slightly taller white Jack Noir at the same time to protect Jade and dies a heroic death in the process. I think that there is a difference, at least within the narrative of Homestuck, between being a hero and being heroic. Dave canonically is heroic. He fights to protect those he cares about. But when Dave says the word hero, he means someone who seeks out battle. To Dave, a hero isn't someone in the minute deciding to defend their loved ones. It's someone who hears about an evil monster halfway across the planet and travels there to fight them. And Dave isn't about that life. After Cascade, Dave takes a bit of a back seat in terms of character development. Of the Meteor crew, he's the one who has his shit together the most. And you can argue that this is because the author didn't know what to do with him for years on end, which is kind of true, but to be fair, Part 3 does give Dave's character arc something important. Scenes of him spending time with other people, forming relationships, and getting to act like a normal person. Then that massive dong or Lord English goes and kills a bunch of ghosts, shattering reality in the process. We see Dave staring up at this the cracks in reality reflected in his glasses. In his conversation with Mina shortly after, he says he's having trouble sleeping because of the screams. Dave realizes his destiny. He is the one who will kill Lord English. And he says, Ugh, fine, I'll fight him, I guess, making it clear that he doesn't really care. Later, after arriving in the Alpha Universe, Jade reiterates that it's Dave's destiny to be the one to land the final blow on Lord English. She reforges the royal derringer into cowed folk. Dave finally gets his hands on the sword and the stone, but it isn't this triumphant moment where he is crowned king. It's played as another weight being placed on his shoulders, against his will. Breaking the sword was always more important to Dave than wielding it. Jade demands Dave practice his time travel abilities, but he refuses. He points out that he hates time travel, that he only did it because he had to, that being gunned down by Jade was traumatizing and he flat up refuses to fight Lord English. Like, he's evil, yeah, but Dave's never met him. Dave doesn't care about his destiny. And he's right! The whole point of the comic's magnificent ending is that Dave doesn't fight Lord English, that none of them do, that John finally breaks free from the shackles of narrative and ignores the destined final battle so they can all live happily ever after. In a lot of stories, Dave's arc would be about him becoming a hero, about him gaining the confidence to slay Lord English, but that isn't what Homestuck is about. And in hindsight, Dave is kind of the first character to put that together. I think the thing that trips a lot of people up regarding Homestuck's themes on heroism is the fact that the comic uses the word hero in a very different way than a lot of other stories. But to be fair, there is a Homestuck character who clearly spells out what the word hero means in the context of Homestuck. And said character is... <sighs> Vriska. As Vriska explains while searching for the ultimate weapon, you don't have to be a good person to be a hero. The way Vriska sees it, being a hero is about fighting the main antagonist. Doesn't matter how much evil shit you do along the way, as long as you win in the end, that makes it okay. No one can judge you for your crimes if you're a hero who saves the day. Honestly, this attitude makes sense when you realize that Suburb is a video game. Vriska is transported into a video game and treats it as such, where the important thing is winning. Where the only sign of heroism is defeat of powerful villains. The thing is, I think this is also how Bro sees heroism. Bro's abuse of Dave to make him into a hero is terrible, but it's for the greater good. Dave is scared of Jack, but Bro goes out to fight him. He goes out to be a hero. Vriska also goes to fight Jack, and as a result, Karkat and Terezi die horribly. 
Bro dies because he tries to fight Jack. Rose dies because she tries to fight Jack. The comic hammers this point again and again, that going off to kill the bad guy and be a hero isn't a thing that works. It's fitting that, at the end of the comic, Vriska stands alone. Everyone else gets to be happy on Earthsea, but Vriska is trapped in a frozen moment of time, staring down a green pimp for all of eternity because she wanted to be a hero. Because John and Dave and the rest of the cast refused to go kill Lord English. Killing Lord English is not a proper climax to Dave's character arc. Dave's arc ends with something far more personal. But before we can talk about that, there's another Strider we need to talk about. A man very similar to Dave, except weirdly orange. And his name is Dave Sprite. Dave Sprite is an excellently written character. He was Dave. For the first couple hundred pages, this is the Dave we focused on. I mean, both Daves are the Dave we focused on, and so are these two, but you get my point. He was Dave, he was the main character, and then he wasn't. He cheats death by becoming a sprite, and in doing so, he steps out of the role of protagonist becomes a secondary character, a guide to the hashtag real Dave. He sacrifices his identity and his humanity to save John and Jade, and then he has to keep living with the consequences. From the moment he is introduced, Dave Sprite is treated as lesser, as the janky bargain bin Dave. By John and by Jade, the very people he gave up everything to save, by the narrative, and eventually by himself. He isn't the real Dave anymore, and that leaves him depressed angry, and aimless. Dave Sprite serves as an interesting foil to Dave. The main Dave the comic focuses on has heroism thrust upon him. He is forced to be a hero by the narrative against his wishes. The core of Dave Sprite as a character is taking Dave and then taking that away from him, making it so he is no longer the hero. And when you take that away, what would Dave be left with? And honestly, Dave Sprite is still just Dave. Like he blames his relationship with Jade collapsing on him being the inferior Dave, but did it? Or did it fall apart because Jade and Dave, any Dave, aren't a good couple? Did it fall apart because Dave was already a guy with an inferiority complex, who was constantly lost in his own head, and being told again and again that he was inferior just made his issues worse? Is Dave's right a secondary character with a minor effect on the plot because he isn't the real Dave, or because he accepted that he wasn't the hero anymore. But, much like Dave, Dave, Dave's sprite is plenty heroic. I love that scene where he defends his other self. And although it is an example of him falling into the trap that is heroism, it took immense courage to try and take on Jack Noir, despite being massively outmatched. He is a guy who could have been a hero, but had that destiny ripped away from him. Homestuck as a whole is a comic where characters are constantly jerked around and screwed over by factors outside their control, by Suburb, by the comic's villains, and ultimately, by the narrative itself. Some characters deal with this by being passive. Dave kinda just goes with the flow. He spends a big part of the comic just doing what Rose, Terezi, or his future self tells him to do. He makes his mocking comments, but for the most part, Dave is a follower. And I think, at the end of the day, that is one of the biggest differences between Dave and Dirk. Dirk Strider likes being in control. I think this facet of his character is best summed up by his conversation with Jade after her computer explodes. He tells Jane that she will be their leader, sort of, but he'll still be the one pulling the strings. He sends a robot to beat the shit out of Jake to make him stronger, something worryingly similar to his alternate self's treatment of Dave. Throughout the first half of part three, Dirk is consistently the only member of his team who is on the ball. While Jane is barely surviving assassination attempts, Roxy is getting drunk and sleepwalking into danger, and Jake is being... Jake, Dirk is killing assassins and getting the team ready to enter the game. And being on top of things is hard. He has to be awake in two different dimensions simultaneously to keep the wheels turning. Hell, half of Dirk's conversations in these acts aren't even Dirk. They're the autoresponder. A clone of Dirk's brain he made to answer his inbox when he's busy. And the thing is, Dirk's control freak nature isn't necessarily a bad thing. In Dirk's defining moment, Unite Synchronization, he is put in an impossible situation where his friends are in danger and manages to save all of them through quick thinking and flawless execution. Unite Synchronization is an amazing piece of animation. Or two pieces of animation, technically. But, after Unite Synchronization, the reader is left with a lingering, uncomfortable question. Did 
Did Derek want this to happen? It features Dirk finally getting his kiss with Jake, and the autoresponder did suggest that Dirk should either make Jake fall in love with him by rescuing him, or better yet, by endangering himself so Jake could save him. And they get together after Dirk does both. Honestly, the autoresponder gives good insight into Dirk's character. He's meaner and more arrogant than Dirk, but is he really all that different? He's manipulative, he's ruthless, and he hides his feelings under ungodly amounts of irony. To be fair, like most homesick characters, this is because of all the hashtag trauma. Dirk grew up alone in a post-apocalyptic water world apocalypse with a cursed doll that should be thrown into a fucking furnace as his only companion. Behind the irony, Dirk is a nervous young man who doesn't know how to interact with other people, who tries to control everything because that's the only way he can feel like things are okay. Hell, that's why Dirk hates the autoresponder so much. He sees himself in Lil Howe sees the potential to hurt people he has, sees that behind the double ironic claims of being a puppet master, the autoresponder is just as much of a control freak as he is. Dirk almost kills him, only stopping when he says he's scared of dying, because Dirk sees himself in Lil Howe. Because he really, really doesn't like himself. Because the autoresponder is every bit as dangerous as Dirk is. And then Lil Howe gets fused with Equius, thus creating the most unbearable asshole in existence, I like Arqueus as a character, but God, could you imagine talking to him for more than 20 seconds? Part of the reason I like Dirk so much is because he could have very easily been a villain, but chooses not to. He has the personality for evil. He has evil force lightning that rips out souls. Bro was a bastard, and Lil Hal eventually becomes Doc Scratch, but Dirk doesn't ever step over that line into evil. And the reason he doesn't do this is because, at the end of the day, he loves his friends more than anything. He is willing to do anything for Jane, Roxy, and Jake. Dirk cut his own damn head off during Synchronize without hesitation to save his friends. He has the ruthlessness Dave lacks, and that isn't necessarily a bad thing. When the situation is dire, when his friends are in danger, Dirk is able to toss aside his flaws and become a hero. But the nobles aren't supposed to be heroes. They arrive not in a game full of challenges, but in an empty session where they are forced to wait for the real heroes to arrive. And what is the use of a man of action in a world of void? Dirk's relationships with the others crumble during the time skip shown in Act 6-4 because he's only good in stressful situations. He doesn't know how to be in a relationship without being obsessive and clingy. He ruins things with Jake and Roxy to the point where he can't even bring himself to talk with them. And when the time of action comes again, he gets teleported to the furthest ring to keep him from interfering. He almost manages to take out Arena, but in doing so he gets himself removed from the fight again. By the time Dirk makes it back, everyone is dead. He wasn't able to control things, he wasn't able to protect his friends, and he is left staring out at the destruction. He does nothing as the stardust consumes him, because he has nothing left. He allows himself to die again, this time not out of strategy, but out of hopelessness. And then that all gets retconned away, something that I still have very mixed feelings about. The first chapter after the retcon, She's Back, is simultaneously a very long chapter that drags on because of the endless conversations, and also a chapter that needed to be longer because there were more conversations I wanted to read. Like for instance, Dirk doesn't talk to Roxy or Jake at all after the retcon. Actually, now that I think about it, Dirk barely talks to either of them, period. Excluding the trickster stuff, he talks to Roxy exactly once and never talks to Jake. It's always the autoresponder, or Brain Ghost Dirk, who is technically also Dirk, but you know what I mean. The only people Dirk talks to consistently are Jane, Caliborn, and Lil Hal. And I mean, it would have been nice to have more conversations near the end, but the pacing was already bad enough as it is, and fortunately, a lot of the conversations we get are among the best in the entire comic. For example, Dave opens up to John that his problems with heroism stem from him associating it with this ideal of a tough manly hero, something he knew he could never live up to. An ideal set by bro that he can't match. He also ties this into his sexuality, admitting that his casual, ironic homophobia was a way to cover up his insecurities about not being manly enough because he's gay. Like, extremely gay. 
And the fact that Dave feels insecure about not being straight due to his inability to measure up to this idea of masculinity set by bro is very ironic. Dave volunteers to fight Lord Jack, not because he wants to, but because someone has to. Some hack writers have said that Lord Jack is a bad character who spends most of the comic doing jack shit, and he is, but you can find some interesting symbolism in Dave fighting what is essentially Lil' Cal, the puppet he was scared of for so long. Honestly, Lil' Cal's influence on Bro probably played a big part in why he was such an asshole, especially when compared to Dirk. All of the saw shit he does is taken from Calborn, and maybe that's why Dave is destined to fight against Lord English because Lord English is in part responsible for his shitty childhood. But Dave doesn't see it that way. He doesn't want a big final battle against the big bad Endgame who's been pulling all the strings, because that would force him to be this heroic knight who charges into battle and nothing is more objectionable for Dave Strider. Right before Collide, Dave finally gets to talk things through with Dirk. But put a pin in that amazing scene, because guess who's still alive? Dave Sprite! And Dave Sprite accidentally fuses with Nepeta, transforming into Dave Peta. This is a weird ending for Dave Sprite's arc, and one that took me a long time to appreciate. It's weird that Dave Sprite stops being Dave Sprite, but the more I think about it, I think that it was what he needed to be happy. To stop being a bargain bin backup Dave and become something new. And Dave Peta Sprite Squared is so happy and so energetic throughout their short screen time because they are finally free of the shackles that was being Dave. Why Nepeta? Well, besides providing parallels to Jade, Jespros, and Arqueus, Nepeta fusing with Dave fits because, at the end of the day, Nepeta was an underdeveloped side character. Nepeta's lack of an impact on the plot is a running gag both in the fandom and in the actual comic. Dave Peta is a fusion of two characters condemned to irrelevancy, deciding to go be important to the plot. Dave Peta says that they are the exact blend of people Lord English should be vulnerable to, and that seems like nonsense, but Caliborn was destined from day one to be super uber important, and Dave Peta is the epitome of irrelevance. Do you think the Equius and Lord English felt bad about going all sans Undertale on a version of Nepeta? Dave gave up his destiny. Dave refused to fight Lord English. And Dave Sprite couldn't have taken that destiny because he was a fake version of Dave. But Dave Peta can take that destiny, can be a hero, because they aren't Dave anymore. There's something entirely new. Dave Peta also inherits the memories of all the dead Daves and sad Nepetas, becoming the ultimate version of them, and there's a lot I want to say about that, but this video has a strict deadline and is already very, very long. Well, admittedly not that long compared to some of my other videos, but you get my point! Anyway, rooftop. Dave and Dirk sit awkwardly in silence, waiting for the fight to begin, and eventually, Dave opens up. Dave admits he hated Bro, that he was left with the impression Bro always hated him. He was trained to be stronger, but it had the opposite effect on him. It made him never want to fight, and hate the idea of being a hero. And his time on the meteor was the first time he spent time with people who actually cared about him. The first time he felt like a human being. He brings up the influence Lil Cal had on Bro, but says that it doesn't change how he feels about him. Lil Cal played a part, but the puppet isn't Dave's real enemy, and neither are Lord Jack or Lord English. Dave apologizes for blaming Dirk and says he isn't responsible, but Dirk isn't so sure. Dirk admits that he ruined things with his friends. He said that he could become far, far worse if his flaws went unchecked. But fortunately, he still has time to be better. The scene ends with Dave and Dirk sharing a hug. And it's such a beautiful moment. Dirk is given a chance to show kindness and affection, while Dave is finally given the love he wanted for so long. And then it comes Collide. Fuck this animation is good. Air of Grief slaps, the art is great, and the ends of the fights are all incredible. Dave and Dirk get their asses beat, with Dave actually using time travel again for the first time in thousands of pages to save Dirk's life. Also, Terezi is there. This fight isn't really relevant to her arc. Said arc is good though, and I'll make a video on it if I get 20,000 views on this video. The fight ends with Warjack smacking Dirk down and choking him with his crowbar. Dirk barely manages to hold the crowbar back using his unbreakable katana. And then Spage jumps in because he wanted to be included in the really cool scene. Dirk and Dave share a knowing look 
as Dave raises his blade. Early in the comic, there was a sword fight on a roof between Dave and his brother. They clashed swords, and Dave's sword broke. And, as the air of grief swells, the reader is reminded of one very crucial fact about Dave Strider. He is very, very good at breaking swords. With a single, incredible swing, Dave cuts through all three necks. In doing so, he breaks the unbreakable katana in half. This scene is so many things. It's Dave overcoming his bro. It's Dave finally getting closure to his grief and to his trauma. It's Dave, at least symbolically, getting to beat up the man who abused him. And for Dirk, it is him letting go of control and letting someone else save the day. It's him once again showing his greatest trait, that he deeply, deeply cares for other people. And then Dave uses a pair of time travel duplicates to grab Dirk and drag him to safety before War Jack explodes into a black hole. And then PM beats Jack and Roxy kills the contents and fuck me, this animation is so good! Anyway, the point of this video is that Dave Strider is a damn good character and easily one of Homestuck's best. I know that this video is a bit scattershot and rambling, but I hope it was able to get across the themes of destiny, heroism, and rebellion at the heart of Dave Strider's character. He's a well-written character essential to the comic's themes. Some people see the fight on the rooftop as Dave finally becoming a hero, and I don't see it that way. I see it as him overcoming the need to be a hero. Dave's arc isn't about him growing to be a big hero who seeks out battle. That was the destiny forced on him by Bro and by the narrative, and he hates it. Dave's arc is about overcoming Bro. It's about him growing past the shackles placed on him, shackles that made him hate heroism and hate himself. It's about finally putting an end to the trauma that has been haunting him, so it can just be the Dave of Guy. He escapes from Homestuck and gets to live a normal, peaceful life with the friends he loves so dearly. After the battle, Dirk is healed by Jane and has a silent conversation with Jake. And then we get the masterpiece that is Act 7, where destiny is defeated and everyone lives happily ever after in a world without conflict. Everyone lives happily ever after. Happily ever after. Happily ever. Happily ever. Happily ever. Could have very easily been a he villain. He tries to control everything. He has the ruthlessness Dave lacks. He has the personality for Step evil. over that line and what evil. is the likes use of being a man of action in a world that's cool and he likes being in control. Likes being in control. Likes being in control. Likes being in control. Likes being in control.